Well, thank you everybody for attending this uh, webinar on uh, what's arguably, I suppose, the biggest day in UK higher education for seven and a half years. Uh, that's, of course, on account of the results of the oddly named REF 2021, uh, now in effect, in effect, REF 2022 results. And I'm, I'm, I'm Paul Jump. I'm the Features and Opinion Editor at Times Higher Education. Um, as a reporter, I covered the 2014 REF and lived to tell the tale. Um, and I've also overseen the planning for this year's REF coverage. Uh, also with me is Simon Baker, who is our data editor, and he put in a huge shift yesterday, readying all our tables for publication. So but do forgive him if he nods off during the course of this. Um, we also have a very distinguished panel today. Uh, we have Mr. Ref himself, arguably David Sweeney, Executive Chair of Research England, which of course conducts the Ref on behalf of the four UK funding bodies. We've got James Wilsden, Digital Science Professor of Research Policy and Director of the Research on Research Institute of the University of Sheffield. And of course, he's well known as the author of the metric tide report, which followed the last ref and directed uh, the funding bodies away, I think, from embracing metrics for this one. We've also got Colette Fagan, who's vice president for research at the University of Manchester, which had a rather good ref this time, I think it's fair to say. And finally, last but not least, we've got Simon Thompson, another Simon, unfortunately, I'll try and disambiguate when I say Simon. Uh, Simon Thompson, he's manager of Clarivate's academic and government consulting team in uh, the UK, Middle East, Europe and North Africa. And he led Clarivate's project to uh, deliver the citation data and support services to this year's REF. Um, over the past decade, he's also directed research assessment and evaluation projects for various governments around the world. And he has a PhD in structural biology. Um, so given that um, I've just introduced David as Mr. Ref, I think it's fair to say he's been, oh, well, he certainly had longer than the rest of us to go over the data. So uh, I think it'd be helpful if David just kicks us off with a few remarks and what strikes him about the data this time. Certainly, thank thanks Paul. Um, let me begin by thanking tremendously the, the Ref team who've done the, the work in really unimaginable circumstances, but the panels also uh, who balance the enormous challenges of uh, working through COVID and supporting both their students and their research. Uh, but today is a day of celebration, I think, for absolutely everybody involved in research enterprise. That's, of course, the academics who do the, 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 the produce the outputs. But uh, let's shout out to the research officers uh, in institutions and the librarians who've done a magnificent job. I'm ever so excited by the work that's been done. Uh, to further open access. So lots and lots of thanks. Uh, what about, what are we celebrating? Well, we are celebrating uh, really evidence of phenomenal research across the UK uh, and across institutions. And we should just start uh, from that. I, I've, inevitably there's comparisons and uh, there's boasting and all that, but the reality is that we're working together in the UK as part of a global partnership uh, to do wonderful research and this is rock solid evidence, uh, notably for the government, but also for our private partners and a range of other public funders that that is the case. Uh, as ever, our supposedly brilliant top-notch research intensive universities have, have done extremely well and we should celebrate that wherever they are. Uh, I think, however, the inclusion this time of everyone with a significant responsibility for research has uncovered, I think, a lot of work which just pre previously was missed in the exercise. And an awful lot of that is more broadly distributed uh, than some of the, the, the myths around research in the UK uh, would suggest. So I'm delighted uh, that it does provide evidence all over the country of excellence, uh, really in uh, quite sizable numbers in places where that hadn't previously been acknowledged. Uh, congratulations, uh, really, uh, to, to those people and uh, to the breadth of activity in the UK. Uh, we built on the impact results from last time that demonstrated that if you spend money on research, you get benefit for your people and for the world. Uh, we now have evidence of embedded and enduring partnerships and of uh, richer sets of uh, evidence of impact. 
Uh, but as with many of the questions that uh, Paul Jump, who's, uh, who's chairing, has asked, uh, until we are able fully to mine that information, we can't answer some of the big questions, which the ref will help to answer. And I'll indicate shortly questions I don't think is there to answer. Uh, so I think today is results day. Uh, let's dwell on the good news, but let's look to build on the uh, rich basis of evidence. I'd point to the Royal Historical Society uh, blog uh, today, which gives real insights into what happened in history. For example, we need more of that. It's, it's interesting, it's insightful, it's evidence of success, and I look forward to discussions with you all today. Thanks for that, David. Yeah, it's, it's certainly striking how, how big the picture is, uh, how good the picture is, rather. I mean, if you, if you look nationally, we've got now 41% uh, four-star research and 43% three-star. That compares to uh, only 30% four-star in 2014 and only 17% um, in 2008, albeit that we didn't have impact in that one. I suppose the first question is, it, you know, is is there an element of, I mean, how, how much do we trust that the, oh, this is a, a very accurate reflection of the fact that UK research has increased, you know, increased in quality hugely over that period and how much of it is, for want of a better term, grade inflation? Well, I'm, I'm going to jump in and answer that, although others yeah. will, will, will say, we are not saying this is a remarkable improvement in UK research. I think there's some external evidence, and, and we'll hear a bit about that, uh, that the UK is doing, doing well and maybe a little bit better. But this is evidence, better evidence, of what's going on than we had previously captured. Comparing those crude numbers is simply the wrong thing to do, and you will get no boosterism uh, from me. Uh, the underpinning benchmarks have been validated, uh, but we have succeeded in capturing far, far better what was going on. And that shows in the results. And that is the story. We will serve ourselves not well at all by overplaying uh, the results. The UK is a phenomenal research nation, however you look at it. And perhaps we'll talk a bit about that as we go on. Uh, but the ref is only endorsing that. It's not suggesting uh, a, a comparison we've got better than Germany or whatever like that. It's not for that and it doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to come in on that, that point? How, how much is it? How, how, you know, what does this exercise teach us that the previous ones haven't, I suppose, is another way of putting it. Colette, you looked like you wanted to say something. Well, the, the main point I would want to um, emphasise is that it really has uncovered research excellence across the sector through the change in rules. So, um, 40, 43% more um, full-time equivalent academics are included. We can see research excellence across all um, institutions in the sector. And I think that gives us a much better handle on uh, the full picture of, of what the sector is doing in terms of quality research, impact from research, and the environment we create to deliver that research and impact. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if a politician's looking at the results, maybe James, you might want to come in on this one. I mean, what, what are they to conclude? I mean, clearly there's lots of excellent research in the country. I mean, is, is this an accurate picture of the state of research as a whole in the UK, or is it just the snapshot of the very excellent stuff that we clearly do? Well, I mean, it, it is a snapshot, um, but it's an important snapshot. And it, one has to remember I mean, in that, political and funding context, one of the critical purposes and roles that the REF plays is, as David's already said, to provide us collectively as a community and uh, those that represent us with the evidence that's absolutely essential to persuade uh, government, particularly the Treasury, to continue investing uh, in the system and particularly investing in the quality related funding strand of that system, which is always, as David will attest, under pressure. Uh, but it is also incredibly important for the overall uh, health and sustainability of the system. And I think we have actually as a product, I mean, partly of the ref, but also as, as a result of Brexit, I think in recent years, gained a far richer understanding of those interdependencies in the funding environment than we had uh, perhaps 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, and, you know, in support of then 
continuing to evidence that and using that evidence to, to, to make the case for continued investment, the REF is incredibly valuable. I mean, I'd also agree with David's point that, and, and Colette said this as well, I mean, you know, what we've had overnight is, is the sort of, you know, research data equivalent of a, of a massive boulder being dropped in a big pond. And, you know, we, we're all looking at the sort of earlier ripples, as it were, and, and we all tend to start obviously probably in our own department and then in our own faculty and then in our own university graduates sort of build the picture up. But a huge amount of the real richness in, for example, the impact case studies is yet to come in the data that will be released. And it's that kind of stuff that also gives uh, policymakers, the funding uh, community, and, and also, you know, academics like me who analyze this stuff, uh, a lot, a, a huge amount, I mean, years of work to really kind of properly tease out all the implications of this so you know we are at the beginning uh, of of that process but i i do agree with the overall tone of, of both what david and colette have said you know this is a day to celebrate uh, the good in the uk research it isn't an international benchmarking exercise we can't say anything comparatively but we can say uh, in terms of us marking our own homework which is what this is that uh, there's lots to be uh, proud about both in terms of outputs and impacts and environment and, and that's something that we should celebrate yeah uh, Sorry, go on. Sorry, I was just going to add on top of, of that, I think also policymakers can take from this a view that there is a, a diversity, um, that there's excellent research occurring across all disciplines, and that there is value being generated by funding all disciplines. And in addition to that, there's also value and excellent research being generated across all parts of the UK, across the, the four nations and the regions. Yeah, well, we should address the game playing point because, of, of course, that's always been a bugbear over the years, that what, what, particularly when you're able to make uh, selective submissions. This time, obviously, the rules have changed and everyone has to be entered. Are, are we all confident that that has led to, you know, a, 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 a ranking? I, I know Research England doesn't do rankings. That, that That's down to us. but. <laughs> and others should be said um but you know are we are, are we confident that that the rankings that have come that have emerged um are more accurate pictures of you know the, the hierarchy of excellence in the uk than previous exercises have been should we put it like that um anyone want to come in on that well uh, I, I would say yes, but I guess at Manchester, I would say that, wouldn't I? So, okay. but putting aside my institutional home, I think capturing everything that is done across the sector gives us a much better picture and a more reliable ranking. And there are different ways of ranking, of course. It's not just about power, it's about percent full star, it's about the GPA. So that we've got lots of takes on different aspects of, of how we can evaluate uh, and celebrate. Yeah. What given, about contract? Sorry, go on, David. Uh, given that we don't do uh, rankings, can I just say that I am pleased that uh, those producing league tables have made clear what are the uh, the differences between their league tables and the different ways of looking at the data. I, I generally would commend uh, the press for their substantial engagement uh, and, and an attempt to illuminate what's going on. Uh, I think... Uh, the, the benefit, I would say, is that we have more transparency uh, for, for academics, for a start. They, uh, they're not, uh, they're, it's clear what their institution is expecting of them. And I think that gives agency to academics to ask for the support to enable them uh, to do their, uh, their best. And I, so I think there's an even-handed uh, approach uh, to, to that. Contracts are not the right place to go uh, for complicated legal reasons, contracts or what they are. What is important is that those working in an institution know what they're being asked to do and are being assessed on what they're being asked to do and not on what they're not being asked to do. So I, I think we've got the right pitch. I'd like to see better join up between, as it were, job descriptions and contracts. But I realise there are many, many difficulties in doing that. And what we want to do is an exercise that helps the individuals and helps the institutions with a degree of transparency about expectations. Yeah, Simon, I know you had a, a, a view. Simon Baker, this is, had a view about, uh, well, I had a theory, let's, let's say, about uh, game playing on, Simon. I, su I suppose it's not so much uh, a, uh, a view as a kind of 
question that I'd like to throw in there. Um, I mean, obviously last time the game playing kind of uh, questions were all about selection of individuals and whether some institutions did that. I wonder if that how, to what extent the changing rules this time so that everyone was submitted, but you could vary maybe the number of, of um, uh, outputs that were submitted uh, between individuals, how much that kind of how that sort of changed has changed the picture in, in other words and how co-authorship might might have entered this as well i mean to, to what extent would some departments might have said well we have we have a th these few research stars they will submit the maximum number and then as long as you make sure that there's kind of co-authorship uh, that, that some of your other researchers have appeared on a paper uh, you know, in, 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 we've collaborated on a, on a excellent project. Then, how how would that varying of of, of of different research outputs and the selection of those would that have been the focus of institutions this time around? I think the way it's done has given a good picture of the portfolio of research going on in an organisation. I think again, it helps individuals because they're not under pressure to produce uh, four. Uh, and I'm, I'm very relaxed about co-authorship, as long as you can defend that everyone submitted had, I was an independent researcher, responsible in some way for research directions. Uh, I, and I, I, I've, not, I've not really heard yet any suggestion, or audit, audit work hasn't uh, identified uh, that people were putting in uh, candidates who didn't pass that independent uh, researcher. Uh, test. So I think it is a richer view of what's going on. And uh, on the whole, we're trying to detach it from being about superstars. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't matter to me at all if there are those who are associated with many uh, outputs that the, uh, that the institution wants to submit. We've obviously capped it so that people don't do very stupid things. But effectively, you can submit double because the average is roughly half what it was uh, before, just slightly more than that. Uh, so I think, personally, I think the flexibility catches it captures a better picture. Again, we will analyse that over time. And uh, people uh, not from Research England, uh, our advisors, experts like, uh, like James and Simon will uh, give their input. Yes, if I could add, Paul, on that point. <clears throat> Simply removing the focus on the individual gives us more of a focus on the collective effort of the unit and uh, team science. Um, and you can only be a co-author by making a contribution. You know, there's audits in place, there are ethical guidelines, etc., about authoring, which we all play to, I would like to think. Um, so what, we, what it allowed us to do um, for units is to select the best portfolio of research within the parameters of uh, minimum and max. Um, so it, it, it's a more inclusive team approach and it actually demonstrates a better picture of the quality of research. So I'm, I'm very comfortable with, with this approach and I hope it's the one we will continue to take forward in future exercises. Yes, I just add to, I mean, I agree with, with much of that. I mean, definitely there has been a reduction in, in the kinds of game playing that we saw in the immediate lead up to the 2014 exercise. Um, and, and the partial decoupling has been helpful. I mean, I personally would have gone for full decoupling, but that's perhaps a debate to come to. But uh, I think in terms of burden, uh, so I was part of the team that took, that carried out the, uh, the so-called real-time ref review um, for Research England, and, and I may put a link in the chat in a second. Uh, and we, as part of that, we surveyed uh, 3,000 researchers across the system. We did in-depth interviews. I actually did them myself with, with uh, you know, the, the PVCs and research leaders of about 20 universities. Um, and uh, I, I do think that demonstrates fairly strong evidence that the burden was reduced as it was experienced by uh, many individual researchers. Uh, I don't think it showed necessarily burden reduction for the institutions in terms of the people managing and running the exercise, um, but that's not uniform. And there clearly are some areas where the burden continues to be strong and where that tends to be the case, it's much more really a matter of, you know, local choices uh, rather necessarily than the design of the exercise, uh, i.e. its institutions choosing to administer and use the exercise in particular ways, you know, shadow refs, uh, etc. That, that, that 
create pressures and burdens. And I mean, I don't think we should deny or, or diminish the reality and, and the seriousness of those problems as they persist. Um, but I think there is a debate to have about the extent to which it's, it's an issue of the design of the exercise relative to, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's varied impl implementation through the system. Yeah. We should, uh, we should probably talk about impact because obviously it's still a relatively new element um, of this and you know despite the initial terror that it provoked people uh 10 years ago i mean it's always actually in the even in 2014 the the scores for impact were actually higher than they were for outputs um and that's also true this time around i think on grey point average impact is 3.35 and outputs 3.14 so it's a you know fairly fairly big difference um i, I mean I, that strikes me a bit odd, really, because often the narrative in the UK is that we do lots of wonderful research, lots of wonderful outputs, but fail to capitalise on it in terms of impact, whereas the ref sort of, in a way, tells the opposite story, doesn't it? Does anyone have any reflections on that, David, maybe? Well, the, the first thing to say is that every country in the world that I know says that I've had it explicitly. <laughs> it's sitting in the White House. I've had it uh, and uh, in, in Japan, actually, uh, also. So I, that, that's... I, I, I don't think that's the focus. I think it is, though, fair to say that we only, we look at a more limited set of impact case studies than we do outputs. Uh, it would be quite surprising to me, given that we are asking for roughly an impact case study for every 10 star, if you couldn't generate very, very good uh, case studies, given the vast amount of work that goes on, and the significant way that universities engaged more with external partners, uh, not just over the last seven years, but I, I think over the last 20 uh, years, there's been plenty of incentives for them to do so. And they've jumped with alacrity, I think, at uh, a much stronger level of engagement with bodies of all kinds. So I, I, I would be astounded if you didn't get absolutely phenomenal case studies. I think the question of discrimination then uh, crops up. Uh, there is still discrimination, even on impact. Uh, in an ideal world, I think it would be good to better discrimination. However, I think it's genuinely difficult. We've developed our discrimination from outputs across uh, a 30-year period with enormous continuity and benchmarked easily against uh, other uh, independent ways of, of looking at outputs. None of that exists for impact. And I do know that those countries, virtually every country that does research assessment has put impact in in some sense. Uh, most of them have ducked out of the richness that we have by going for relatively crude metrics that may well work across one or two disciplines. I want the UK to say that every discipline is focused as a considerable part of its research activity on sharing the fruits with partners and helping every citizen in our country, I think we can do that. Mm. Simon Th Thompson, do you, do you, given your sort of international experience with research assessment, I don't know, would, would you echo David's point there about every country having the same narrative on impact, but nobody getting to grips with it the way we have? I think certainly, I think there's been a lot of perceptions about impact, and I agree with David's point there. Most countries have the perception that their research maybe isn't generating the impact it should. I think that's one of the, the strengths of the REF is that it this data set does allow us to demonstrate impact, but also because it takes that narrative approach, it does capture that breadth of impact. Um, I mean, impact is, is a hugely diverse thing. It varies between disciplines um, massively. Um, and actually having that narrative allows a, a way of capturing this that perhaps metrics don't give that, 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 that range. Metrics are more specific. They look at very, very specific things. It's not to devalue them. They're very useful. But actually, this, this, this narrative approach that, um, that's been adopted in the REF is, is really strong and it's very helpful. Mm -hmm. It's very helpful in terms of, of our work as well, trying to analyze the, the impact of UK research. Um, and it's certainly something that other countries do ask about when we, when we speak to them about research evaluation. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, for, for all the sort of universality of, of impact and the ref in terms of subjects, I mean, it's, it's, it is also true that if you look at the national profiles that Research England helpfully provide, I mean, you, you can see that uh, the ones that rank, the subjects that rank highest for impact are the ones that you might expect to, namely public health and clinical medicine and philosophy, but perhaps equally predictably is at, is at the bottom, although that's how classics does, does rather well. Um, I mean, so, I mean, despite the fact that, you know, we obviously we're trying to get impact in every subject to demonstrate it in the ref, but it's clearly some subjects find that easier that still find that easier than others. Um, it, is that something we just have to live with or is there a better way to do it? Does any, any views on that? Well, can, can I can I just step back from the GPAs a little bit on this yeah. um, and, and just reflect on, on a, a few things before we come back to those. So I think impact for story over the last two refs is, is that one example of how the ref exercise helps drive innovation and excellence in the sector um, through a focus. So, you know, the Ref 214, yes, there was nervousness. There was a lot of institutional learning that needed to take place. Um, maybe some retrofitting in a few areas. Um, and as a sector, we've learned over this period how to do impact better and how to evidence it. Um, and certainly when I started in 214 with, um, at, Manchester, I thought it would be easier to evidence impact in some bits of panel A and B than in the arts and social sciences. That was not the case. It's different kinds of impact. It's often less linear, you know, invention to, to market is the sort of stereotypical example. But what we have with the impact cases is really rich evidence narrative. So we can understand what our colleagues are doing in disciplines which we're really quite remote from and we can translate the official impact cases into slightly more digestible for wider audiences, our stakeholders, our students. So it gives a really rich and exciting, and I would argue the most interesting part of all the submissions to, to look at. And then of course it, it flips into GPA scores and you know, are the panels exactly scoring on, on the same you know, gradation? There's always a bit of, room for moderation, a bit more moderation perhaps, but I'm less concerned about whether panel A, the GPA for their impact was slightly higher than panel D. I'm more interested in saying, let's have a look at what's in panel D, the range of uh, impact cases and stories, as well as the major um, reforms and impact we've had on health um, and, and other areas of the uh, society. So let's let's hold the GPAs in perspective a little bit and use the narratives to communicate more widely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I could just endorse what Colette's just, I mean, go back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, evidencing the case for investment, you know, public investment in the research space. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, of course, you know, Treasury officials are going to want to pour over uh, quantitative data, but it, the impact case studies are, are, as Colette said, an incredibly rich resource uh in in more narrative form uh although there is also data in some of the impact case studies now um that we can use as in, in all the ways that have just been described to all sorts of different audiences including government uh to, to demonstrate the 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 you know some of what the system's doing i mean the impact cases are I mean, you know we talked about the outputs being a, a snapshot of a certain bit of research i mean the impact case has even more so this is only a very very small uh slice of some of the most exciting impact that fits the model uh, uh, through which the ref assesses impact you know so there's lots of other forms of impact that do occur uh, in the system and we shouldn't again pretend or, or, or you know mistake what's in the case studies for the totality of what's going on um, but in the system having impact since 2014 has given all of those activities more space significance resource emphasis in the higher education system and I think that is a very good thing uh, even though there's lots we could do to continue improving the way we think conceptualize measure uh, assess what impact is in all of its myriad forms so you know think about the alternative if it was a world of just outputs uh, uh, you know you really are narrowing the system down towards a, a, what we have now is a, a, a very rich ecosystem of activity and the ref is an important part of, of 
um, valuing, recognising and incentivizing and rewarding that activity. Uh, but it's not the totality. And I agree completely. I don't think it's particularly helpful to look at, you know, in detail. At the, I mean, obviously, departmentally, people will and in universities, they will. But you know, it, that's not really what the impact piece of this is about. It's, it's about that much bigger picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, t I take that point. I mean, for, for all for all the breadth, though, and it, it clearly impact brings in an element of what universities do that, that wasn't previously in the ref. I'm actually struck by how closely uh, impact scores and output scores correlate, actually. I mean, generally, we've got Simon's done a graph, which we haven't published yet. But generally, if you do well on output, you do well on impact as well. The, the, I mean, it hasn't shaken up the sort of pecking order as much as people thought it might when it came in um yeah I just... to, be fair, to be fair paul the objective was not to shake up the the, <laughs> the, object, the objective was uh, to demonstrate first of all to demonstrate the impact that was already happening because it wasn't as visible as it could have been and secondly to indicate to institutions that uh, that there was reward for engaging in research and working with partners uh, to develop it i i just say and one further and really important feature is we're not trying to get everyone to copy the way medicine works. Uh, there are just stunning contributions to the quality of our life across a huge range of disciplines, and we ought to evaluate their impact. I'm not even sure I'm happy with the word evaluate, but we ought, uh, we ought to look at it in terms of what that discipline offers uh, to all of our national and international activity. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the, f f f sorry, Colette, were you going to say? Well, I was going to, yeah. it's, it's, one would expect some correlation because we're talking about research. Mm. Um, and if, if we think about how it's shaped and rewarded behaviour on the ground with the academics and the teams doing their research, it's shifted the mindset to think, what is your research ambition and your agenda? And where appropriate, what is the kind range of impacts that you will aim to deliver as part of that project. So if you're doing good research in many areas, and not all are going to deliver impact in the ref sense, because there's lots of other things we need to be able to do to keep the vitality of the disciplines and uh, knowledge moving forward. But one would expect good research to produce good impact in a range of ways. And then we select a subset of that to, to showcase in, in REF. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess the last aspect of the results I think is worth discussing is interdisciplinarity, because that's obviously a, a long running bone of contention as well. And, you know, the argument is as long, you know, when you've got a panel based assessment system, you know, interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity is always going to be difficult to, uh, to assess. I know there are various mechanisms to try and overcome that difficulty. Um, David, I mean, do you have a view on how successful those have been this time around? Uh, the early indications I've had in terms of the panel reports, which will go to our interdisciplinary panel, Athene Donald uh, chairs, the early indications are good. But really, I, I, it's one of those things, Paul, that I'm nervous about talking about till we've got better uh, evidence. I've never felt myself that uh, that the UK had a problem with interdisciplinary research. I did think we needed to set some incentives in place uh, to encourage staff and I think research councils working together have already gone some way towards that. The whole framework of UKRI is supportive of it. And uh, well, just to pick out a scheme since I'm involved with it, the strength in place, the scheme has seen plenty interdisciplinary and collaborative work with private uh, partners. So I, I don't think we're in crisis territory. I think we're in learning how we can do it a bit better territory. I think uh, the ref this time will feed into that, but it's premature to draw conclusions until uh, we look in more detail at the evidence. Mm -hmm. Kelly, I mean, did you have a view on, you know, how confident you were putting in interdisciplinary um, uh, outputs as you know whether they would be marked as highly as as monodisciplinary ones i think i was um mm. i think it, for some of our academics and some of our units there is a, a little bit of uh, if you've got two excellent things we will um prioritize putting in the this 
straight disciplinary if one can actually talk about that. I, I really think we need to wait for the evaluation of how the flagging has worked this time. There may be room for improvement in how we do it, but let's let's wait for the results of the evaluation in terms of how we can make it simpler and perhaps more valid in how we flag interdisciplinary without privileging over disciplinary, uh, without privileging interdisciplinary over disciplinary research. You've got to have excellent disciplinary research before you can build excellent interdisciplinary, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with Colette on that. I think I think we definitely need to look at the, the, the more detailed data. I think, though, I mean, if we're thinking about the future of the exercise, there is clearly a, uh, a, a sharpening tension between lots of imperatives elsewhere in the system towards uh, larger scale inter transdisciplinary research of various kinds uh, and the reversion every six, five, seven years to a, a you know, UOA based assessment structure. And I think that that's one of the things clearly that needs to be, I think, looked at now in the next cycle. Uh, I would say as well that to my mind, you know, looking at how the panels dealt with interdisciplinary, I mean, is important, but it's a, it's really, again, only a very small part of what's going on. Most of what's happening here is, is happening backstage. It's what's going on inside uh, departments, upstream of the submission process. It's about uh, selecting, sifting, prioritising, deprioritising. And I think there, uh, there is still a lot to understand and, and also I, I feel to be concerned about one of the best books I've read just recently in this whole area I'll give a plug uh, uh, a former LSE academic uh, Juan Pablo Paraguera is about to bring out a book on called the quantified scholar looking at this process in sociology uh, and what he described with very very rich data and quality in, you know material is is that process the backstage process of valorizing and uh, uh, you know, deprioritizing certain sorts of activity in preparation for, for, for a ref exercise. And so I think, I think, you know, we do need to give this question more um, holistic attention through the system. Mm. Simon, Simon Thompson, do you have a, a view on that? I mean, maybe this is actually an area where metrics that have some, some advantages in that, you know, they don't discriminate at all between d disciplines, do they? Well, You've got to be careful that you, you normalize metrics yeah. for disciplinary differences. Um, but at the same time, I think one of the trends we've noticed is that as a lot of research policy and funding has moved towards focusing on interdisciplinary challenges and those sorts of areas, that actually interdisciplinarity is, is increasing, um, although there's lots of different ways in which you can mention you can measure that um, but as interdisciplinarity increases that we will see a greater potentially a greater diversity of, of outputs and impacts being generated um, and it will be interesting to see what the what the data actually show once we've had a chance to to really analyze them and get to grips I think it's as others have said it's it's a bit premature to to go down that route. Yeah. So in, in terms of the process uh, itself, James has touched on this a little bit already, but um, obviously there was some hope that the uh, rule changes this time around would make it a bit less burdensome for everybody um, making a submission. Um, from what, you know, the few comments I've heard is that that might have been true for individuals but not for um, institutions themselves who've still clearly had to do a lot of strategizing over what to submit and what not. Um, again, Colette, you might be best placed to ha have a view on that. Do you think it has, has it been any easier this time around? Uh, some elements have been easier, but we've, we've shifted the way, but we do the preparation. So um, the most time consuming is the uh, output. Uh, preparation and we've moved from focusing on the individual through to getting the best po possible profile um, of outputs selected for the unit. Um, I think that's that was worth doing, I think that's worth doing but um, it hasn't reduced the burden. Um, 
there are other elements and the, of course we've got the um, uh, FRAP exercise running currently for recommendations on a number of things of, of how we could slim um, some, of, some of the activity. Um, so certainly the Russell Group, we're suggesting things around uh, the environment statements, um, which can be very time consuming for the proportion of um, weighting that they get. Um, so I think there's some changes we can make in the system, um, perhaps also around uh, the inclusion of staff and the, the one output um, requirement. Uh, but we should also keep the burden in perspective in terms of the, um, the estimated cost by Hefke for mm. running this exercise. Sorry, I think it was Hefke at the time, uh, Research England now owns, uh, running this exercise relative to the absolute award and allocation of QR. Mm. Um, it's it's a burden, but it's a burden worth bearing, particularly if we can get it down a little bit more for the next exercise, for the importance of QR and QR allocation. Yeah, yeah, and, oh, yeah. Sorry, go on, David. Yes, I, I mean the, the the cost the cost to the public purse directly of running this exercise is is in the the noise of the billions that we distribute. However, I, I'm not overselling that. The cost to institutions of the effort they put in is tremendous. And I, I do have a unique insight, I think, to that, because I, I was Colette in, for the 2008 exercise in an institution, uh, and I watched how uh, heavily engineered, I'm being careful not to say over-engineered, heavily engineered it was in some institutions as opposed to others, and James has made that point. I think I, we need to think more collectively about how we manage our research process, which is not just all about the REF, uh, and whether we should do it differently. I, I think there are advantages from a long-term cyclical approach, in my view, uh, so I'm actually in favour of that, but that's a discussion uh, to have. I'm also strongly in favour, and the early feedback from FRAP shows that the relative rigour of the process is attractive to universities. But the most, I think, common co uh, comment is that they'd rather that we nail down what the next exercise was as soon as possible so that investment plans could be made and support provided for staff rather than spending two years agonizing about it. Uh, also fair to say that, uh, if th that mostly the input is concentrated on critique of the exercise or of how you could fix little bits of it, rather than a really genuine suggestion uh, about a reform into which institutional uh, support for their staff and strategic uh, choices uh, could be placed. Uh, so I think it's a challenge, and I, I make all these comments knowing it won't be me that does it, because uh, I'm uh, going on uh, to other things. Uh, so whoever's going to take my place, uh, that's the message. Do you think, David, it's incumbent on uh, research, well, the, the, all the funding bodies, to bear in mind how universities themselves might over-engineer whatever it is that the funding bodies they suggest? Because it's often observed, isn't it, that the rules themselves actually aren't that complicated, but universities rather overcomplicate them. Yeah, it, um, it is incumbent on the funding bodies, but let's not go over the top on, on that. I don't want to get into the boat where we might be on some elements of the education side, uh, where really there's quite a degree of uh, well, attempt at standardising what happens across places. That may or may not be appropriate on the education side, but it certainly isn't appropriate on the research side. So I don't, I don't think universities should give up the responsibility for choosing their own strategic directions. And indeed, I think the most successful universities, as we go through quite a difficult period with inflation, and managing uh, different research structures, I'll say tactfully. Uh, I think the most successful universities will be those who are prepared to take the difficult strategic decisions, in some cases to say no to things, rather than continually be pushed in to doing things. The agency is with universities working constructively with their uh, academics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. James? Well, just I, I, I agree very much with David there. I mean, I think I think the, you know, so much of this debate about a burden, and I mean, I, I often say that 
it goes back to purposes you know what is the exercise for the exercise has accumulated additional purposes over the uh, uh you know three and a half decades now that we've been doing this in different forms um, and it is right and the frat process now is doing this to take a step back and ask very fundamental questions about whether there are now too many purposes whether those purposes conflict but you know looked at in formal value for money terms i mean even if you just take the allocation purpose which is the most sort of obvious and immediate one it, it is good value for money compared to other modes of allocating money through the system you know grant funding most obviously um uh, but the question is in terms of all the other things that it does for the management the strategic direction the understanding of research uh you know what price do you put on those things and how do you do them without a ref uh, and what balance do universities individually as institutions and collectively as a sector want to strike between, in a sense, pushing more of that responsibility into the management of this assessment framework or retaining local agency and uh, autonomy over it. And I think that's a really important debate. The worst management of the REF is bad management. It's not the REF necessarily. That's, it's bad and, it, and it's bad management to sort of scapegoat the exercise as the reason that you're taking weak, bad, stupid decisions in your own institution. We see far too much of that in the UK, our education system. Uh, so we have to decide how much we want the exercise to do, what purposes it plays, uh, what those purposes are worth in terms of the input of time, energy, effort, money, uh, and then design an exercise that, that, that appropriately fits that. And I do well, I mean, I think the FRAP process that, that David and colleagues have initiated is really good in the sense that it does surface all of those big questions uh, we have to see now how the process plays out and ultimately how much appetite there is in government because it will all of this stuff will land on the lap of ministers in the autumn what appetite they have to then uh you know tackle what would be quite a significant reform to the system preserving autonomy and our control over resource and the qr strand is a hugely important thing and it sits in some political tension to a lot of the other things that government tries to do to us as a sector so you know there's a lot to play for here and we need to really think about this in the, in, in the context of, of the future of university research funding as a whole I, I don't know if i could just sort of come in there because this is very allied to a point that i wanted to to make as well um I mean, what is the risk that obviously one of the key sort of messages from the results that I've, I've seen are is that there has been a kind of a more of an inclusive it's moved away from the, the golden triangle or London and the southeast a bit there's been a bit more kind of spread uh, and that will obviously inform funding if the funding formula stays the same but what's the risk you know thinking like a, a politician well, I do that a lot but as a minister that um, when they look at this in a very simple terms, they might start to go, well, if, if everyone, if there's excellent research everywhere and it's, 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 it's easy to spread about. And I thought the ref was about uh, defining excellence that they will, they'll miss that point about the other things the ref does in terms of how it incentivizes um, things within universities. There's a risk that a government further down the line will start to wonder whether they should be putting the money into that process. I think there's, there's always risks, uh, but I've found ministers over quite a long period now, I think 12 ministers, uh, all willing to listen and engage and yes, challenge. Uh, so I, I, I think, yes, we, it's basically people in my position's uh, responsibility to, to manage uh, that. I'd also, I know one political commentator saying, yeah, we just need to abolish this, uh, this um, bureaucracy and have stronger central direction. Uh, well, that's a choice that those contributing on uh, the uh, scrutiny that's largely carried out by your peers, not your managers and not by the government, uh, I, with, of course, the use of partners uh, in research, uh, research users. Uh, it's your choice. Perhaps this is also the moment to, to talk explicitly about metrics, because clearly they're a temptation to, to ministers. You know, we, I know Gordon Brown was quite keen on them, for example. Um, and you can see the argument from a minister's point of view. You know, it's much cheaper to do it that way. And actually, you get a broader picture of the whole spread of research and not just the stuff deemed excellent by universities. I know, Jay, obviously, James, you're, you're not convinced of the case for metrics, but presumably this is something that's going to be revisited as it always is after every um, assessment exercise. 
Are, are we, you know, are, are, do, what's your sense of the sort of political winds, I suppose, as much as anything about how likely we are to go down that track? Well, I mean, David might answer the political movement. I think I think the general uh, viewing government is 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 less in favour of sort of simple metric based solutions now than than it was perhaps, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, I, I mean, to, to, to just clarify the, the, the argument last time around, no one denies that there are algorithmic metric based ways of doing aspects of the ref and particularly the allocation could be done algorithmically. Uh, you know, through metrics, uh, you know, in a relatively straightforward way. But you're back to this point, you know, if you want to also incentivize, uh, understand, measure and reward impact, given that that's largely qualitative as it's captured, we don't have good indicators that are proxies for most of those impacts. Uh, you can't do that by impact. And, and then, you know, so on through all the other purposes that ref performs. So the conclusion of my review in, in 2015 was that, you know, if we want to achieve the purposes of the ref, as stated, a purely metric based exercise is not going to do it very well. And even on the output side, there are lots of other issues as well in terms of, of you know, problems and limitations in the citation data, uh, particularly obviously as you go into panel C and D. So, so, so that was the argument. Now, now, next time around, yes, it is important to look at this again. Uh, and it's important to look at it in the context of the design and the purposes of the overall exercise. If the purposes change or, or are refined, limited, if the design changes, for example, if you're if you're analyzing, you know, the more you move the level of analysis up in the system, away from the individual, away from it, up to the unit, even up higher, maybe you know, entire factor going for our point about interdisciplinarity, entire institutions, the 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 signal noise, you know, the, the, the metric, the, the limitations of metrics start to be less problematic because you're getting a, a more accurate if if you know, bigger, richer, sort of big data picture. Uh, so, so that is worth looking at. Uh, and, and I think, I mean, I jumped the gun over, but I mean, I think we, we, you know, we are going to be, there's, there is a process that's going to be announced shortly to uh, uh, do this. Maybe David can, can say more about, I don't think it's yet been formally announced, uh, but at least to revisit and see whether the arguments or the conclusions that we reached last time around still hold. But I would say that, that, that you know, the answer to the question, it, it has to flow from those earlier Questions of purposes, questions of design, then question of metrics. It, you, you can't start with the metrics. Yeah. Here, here, here I drive my comms team around the bend by indeed uh, drawing on of what James hints at. It's essential that we update uh, the, uh, with what's happened uh, since uh, James's review. Uh, I, it's essential that we update looking internationally as well. So. Uh, uh, because James, I think, did a great job last time. I hope he will draw on some of the same people and some of the new, uh, some new people uh, to uh, refresh where we're going. The last exercise was largely driven by the, uh, in my view, short-term popularity of alt metrics. I think uh, that's not really the way I would look at it this time. I think there's there's a lot to learn from different forms of metric analysis, and uh, we should we should just simply get on and do that, so watch this space. Can so I just I'm, add oh, oh, sorry, that, that, just yeah. a, a back to basics question really, and I say this as a social scientist who works with and taught with both quantitative and qualitative. If we just have metrics, which is just another way of saying numbers, isn't it really? Um, you get a very impoverished picture. If that's all we're gonna do to say what this university is doing and what this university is doing. Um, all numbers are imperfect. There's always a bit of noise around them. You need qualitative and contextual interpretation to give the rich picture we, we have. So responsible metrics, which may need some updating, plus some narrative, which might be reduced if we've got a better uh, suite of agreed metrics, which we're gonna use in the environment statement, for example, will land us in a better place where we paint a better picture, which is what we're trying to do. We evidence it and we reduce some of the burden in terms of how we produce and interpret the evidence. Mm -hmm. Simon Thompson, as a, yeah, as a data provider yourself and obviously somebody with links to lots of governments, you must have a strong view on this. I do actually, and it's very, very similar to, to what everybody else has already said. Yeah. That, you know, as James was saying, you start off with your purposes, then you design, design your evaluation or your assessment, and then you choose the indicators that supports the, the the assessment that you've designed, whether they be 
bibliometric indicators, whether they be peer review derived indicators um, or, or otherwise qualitative narrative indicators as well. They're, they're all valuable. And in order to serve the purposes of the, the REF as it currently is, you need to capture more than can just be captured with citation data or other metrics. Not that they're not useful. Um, and as James was saying, you know, when you get up to those higher levels of, 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 of evaluation, when you, you're looking at larger um, aggregations of people and, and subjects that, you know, perhaps there's, there's, there's a different role that metrics can play, but actually it comes back to that fundamental question of you design your evaluation and then you choose your indicators, not the other way around. Um, and once you've designed your indicators, you can look at how do you minimize the burden in collecting those those indicators rather than starting off from perhaps the other the other end of the process mm -hmm. yeah we're getting towards the end now but one thing i've heard suggested in terms of what we do next is specifically a lot of people seem to be talking about the environment section the suggestion is that perhaps that could be used more constructively to incentivize good behavior you know there's a lot of talk about improving research cultures now all the focus on edi and things like that um and you know i suppose you might you might almost say that that would counter some of the negative um, perceptions of the ref and you know obviously you know some people argue that it it, it incentivizes bad behaviors uh, you know by pushing people just to focus on churning out good impacts at the you know to the extent to the exclusion of any other good thing that they might be doing. So I just wondered, has anyone got a view on whether we could make better use of the environment section in that way? I think if you want to promote certain types of behaviour, you can use assessment to, to drive that. People do respond to the way in which they're assessed. So if you want to change research culture, you can have indicators of research culture that you, that you include in there. And you use that to drive changes in, in the behavior you see. I think it's it's that question of purposes again. Mm. David, you, you look like you have a view. Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, first of all, that is certainly an objective of the Future Research Assessment uh, Programme. Uh, I'm not personally convinced at the moment that we have got uh, a degree of rigor around the environment that would enable us to foundationally change the way we do things. I'm interested, Rachel Norman has published, uh, I, actually with you, I think, in Times Higher, a piece about it. I think it requires, uh, if we're going to maintain rigor, uh, more work than, we, uh, than we've done to date to work out how we can uh, drive uh, sensible and right behaviors without introducing perverse incentives. The usual stuff. Mm. Look, there's an incredible amount of talent about, even. In, on this webinar, uh, Paul, you yourself have thought uh, quite hard uh, about this sort of thing, but uh, l lots of people out there. This, to me, is an immediate focus, uh, but we do need some quite concrete suggestions, I think. The, a great sociological analysis of it uh, would be wonderful, but it won't help in the short term. It would be for not this cycle, but the next cycle. So can we please get on with some stuff? that perhaps might not transform the exercise, but at least move things in the right direction. And if the evidence is compelling, move things a bit more quickly. Mm. Can I, would, would, sorry, James, go on. Well, no, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I mean, I think there is a lot to be said for thinking about the role of the exercise in, in, in incentivizing culture change and good behavior. Uh, even though it does come with with lots of dilemmas and risks, as, as David said, I mean, you're back to, you know, do you want to add then a, another purpose to this to this process? But I mean, I'm going to borrow from a point that Lizzie Gad made recently at an event I was at for, for, from Loughborough. You know, if you, you, you think about when you when you mark, you know, typically marking a student's work or paper, you'll have your 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 summative assessment part of it and then your formative assessment part where, you know, you're saying basically how can you do better and what can you and i think you know thinking about the ref, the ref has traditionally been much more about summative assessment than about formative assessment where there is some in the panel guidance and i think there is something quite powerful about that shift of mindset when we come to think about the design of the next exercise 
quite what that looks like in terms of research culture, I think does need very careful thought for the reasons that David said, you know, be sort of be careful what you wish for before we kind of create a new uh, bureaucratic sort of machinery. But if we can get it right, and, you know, and I think there are examples of where it has by and large been done, I mean, impact, you know, is a form of culture, a massive form of culture change that we've undergone in the last 10, 12 years in the system. Uh, the move towards open research, which REF has, is not the pure driver of, but certainly has accelerated dramatically in terms of, of, of uptake. So there are, there are good examples of positive behaviours that the REF is a very powerful mechanism for uh, accelerating and spreading through the system very fast. Uh, with research culture questions, which I'm hugely you know, in, in supportive of us tackling and a big focus of my own work, uh, we just need to think quite hard about what exactly uh, we can and can't build into an exercise like this without creating a new set of problems. Mm. Colette, final, final last, last word on this. Oh, lovely. Thank you. <laughs> um, just to build from James, as we should also not duplicate what we're doing in other initiatives around the sector. So Research England um, and the REF exercise could perhaps capture. So for example, there are concordates on research and development, on research integrity. We've got a whole big push on reproducible research. These are all part of research culture and environment. And what we don't want is duplication of effort. And we want some join up between acknowledging um, where evaluations have happened elsewhere, where action plans are being implemented and driven forward as part of the environment, rather than having to rewrite another book on this. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, th well, thanks to everyone. We could talk about this all, all day, couldn't we? And no doubt that's what everyone will be indeed be doing. But I'm afraid that for, on our part, we have to leave it here. So it just remains for me to thank again the panel for a very, very interesting, stimulating discussion. Thanks to everybody for watching and enjoy the post-ref drinks later. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone.